Let us pray. Interrupt us, O God, with your presence. Intrude upon our preoccupation, our restlessness, our discontent, and our boredom, that we might center our hearts and minds on your word as it is read and proclaimed this day. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus went out about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. And flipping to the end of Matthew, the commissioning again of the disciples as Jesus leaves. And the words he gives them changes just a little. For Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, the word go is all over the Bible, from the very beginning to the very end. It's just people being sent out all over the place. It's hard to really narrow down specific passages because it's everywhere. There was this time I was leading a Bible study on the Gospel of John, and we were in chapter 14 where Jesus is having that kind of last meal with his disciples before he sends them out um, knowing that he is about to be tried and crucified. He's teaching his disciples, preparing them to go out, and he says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these. So in this Bible study, we read these words, and I asked my group in this study, I said, Do you believe? that you will do greater works than Jesus? Well, I got an immediate no from everyone in there. And one person even thought it was heretical for me to even ask. But there it was in John. Jesus saying, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these. So you take these words and you hold them alongside our reading in Matthew today. Then Jesus sent them out. 
cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, go. I mean, we can kind of picture the disciples, feel how we might feel. They're kind of walking off, looking at one another, so who knows how to do this? Peter, have you figured it out yet? James, do you have any idea what Jesus is talking about this time? Philip, where are we supposed to go? I mean, put yourself in these shoes. We are people who rarely even invite people to church. Yes, we have chosen to follow, to follow. And you know, we're pretty content being a follower. We got that part down. Jesus, you just take the lead. You seem to know what you're doing. We trust you. So you just keep driving. We will just follow. But then, just as for the disciples, the rules kind of change. Go, Jesus says. It's your turn. He looks at them and says, okay, guys, I need some help. And guess what? I'm nominating you. Barbara Brown Taylor has this sermon all about this passage, and she says, Jesus holds his hands out over you, says a prayer that travels down your backbone like a chill, giving you authority. And when he's finished, you open your eyes, you look at each other to see if you can tell any difference. Next, you take a deep breath to test whether anything has changed inside. Do you feel wiser, stronger, more capable? Nope. Just blessed, sort of. And there you are. Jesus calls your name and says, here's what I need you to do. Preach the kingdom. Heal the sick. Raise the dead, cleanse the outcast, cast out demons, have a good time. I can't wait to hear your stories when you get back. Now go. And again, go is all over the Bible. Being sent is all over. And Jesus in Matthew, well, he does this again. Our second reading, the end of Matthew, another story. Jesus again sends the disciples. This time, though, Jesus really does hand over the reins. He takes the 11 disciples to a mountain and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now, if you read this account in Luke, it's even heavier because Luke's account says, and then he withdrew from them. So here we are again. Here they are. Eleven people. Eleven. I mean, they are already down one man. Jesus has pretty much given them a trial run while he was alive, Sending them out, they report back. And I don't know if you remember many of these stories of the disciples, but they messed up a lot. They said the wrong things a lot. And after all of that, the man that was leading them is taken into custody, dies the most painful, humiliating way possible, and they just run and hide then the unbelievable happens. He comes back. All right, they say. Great. We aren't through. He's back. We can do this. Here we go again. We're good. Then 40 days later, you're on a mountain. You're hanging out. And wait a minute. You want us to do what? And as you utter these words, Jesus, as Luke says, withdrawals. You can see why that next book, the beginning of Acts, has the disciples just kind of standing there looking up into heaven. I think I would be too. And can't you just hear one of them insisting, no, guys, just, just wait a little longer. 
He's coming back. Remember last time is this classic Jesus. But eventually, one of them looks around and says, it's go time, friends. So for any of us that ever worries about the state of the church, just remember this picture, this picture of 11 people on a mountain charged with an unimaginable task and an unbelievable story who go. 11 people. And here we are. I've been reading this book, Lives of Unforgetting, by Stant Latour, and he has this section that he entitled, Faith is a Verb. And he's not trying to be witty or clever, but he says he was delighted and overjoyed, in fact, when he looked at the Greek and he read faith as a verb. He says faith in English for us, it's it's more of a noun, a set of beliefs. So for us to translate the original meanings is we'd have to say things like, I believe, I trust, I am committed, I am loyal, I am persuaded, I am confident, all of these things and more. And he says, faithing in the Bible is a process, a daily relationship, a daily living out of that greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. My faith, he says, it's not my belief about God. It's my willingness to step out of the boat onto the water if God should call, even if I sink, even if, like Simon Peter, I sink. To step out of the boat and into the water. In other words, to go. He says, I want to trust, I want to commit, I want to believe, I want to follow. I want to faith into my God deeper and deeper. And to faith is to abandon comfort and embrace vulnerability because you love someone and you trust that they love you and that that love is of more worth to you than all the world. That love becomes worth risking it all. That is the adventure, he says. One that will require unexpected choices and wild risks of us. As readers, as followers of Christ, as human beings, that is what faithing is. To step out of the boat, to go to preach the kingdom, to cure the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, to cast out demons, to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations to the ends of the earth. These are not easy callings. So where do we even begin? You know, this is the, this is the Bible that we give our kindergartners and that I read a lot from And one of my favorite things about it is that it just has this simple little prayer at the end of every story that it shares. Just a tiny, short sentence prayer. The idea being that if we read these with our children daily and say these short sentence prayers, that somehow they're being shaped. Shaped into understanding what it means to go. So let me just read you a few of these. It was hard for me to narrow it down, so there's a lot. Dear God, help me to enjoy and care for your beautiful earth. Help me to do what is right and to remember you love me even when I'm wrong. Help me to be a blessing to others. Help me to trust your promises. Dear God, help me to see the whole world as your home. Help me to love my brothers and sisters. Let my love be stronger than my anger. Let me have the courage to do what you ask of me. Dear God, help me to bring freedom to all your children. Let me love all people no matter where they come from. Let me hear you when I call. Help me to be brave. Help me to protect the powerless. Help me to protect my community. Help me to be your messenger of hope and love. Help me to love my enemies. Help me to share in your plan for the world. Help me to follow you. Help me to see your dream. Help me to care about everyone. Help me to care for those who are sick. Help me to be honest and fair. Help me to see you and everyone I meet. Help me be a willing servant. 
help me forgive. And the very last one, help me to make your dream of a new earth come true. I mean, these are short little sentences in a children's Bible. But they're simple ways that remind us, oh, this is what it means daily to go. That we are the disciples. We have been instructed, go, make disciples of all nations, climb every mountain, go forth as providers of God's love. As Taylor says, it's simply what you do when you know who you are and who you're working for. When you're sent out to proclaim the kingdom and to act it out with no money, no shoes, not even a walking stick. Because when it comes down to being providers of God's love, there's only one real provider. The one who sends us out with nothing at all and with everything we need. Healing, forgiveness, restoration, resurrection. These are the only things we really have to share with the world. And it's the only thing the world really needs. And you know, we learn. We learn what these things are and how to share this as we live our faith as a verb within the community of faith. As we practice these, even if it is by simply lifting up a simple short prayer at our bedside each night that reminds us of who we are and whose we are. So go, climb every mountain, search high and low, follow every byway, every path you know. Climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow. As God says, till you create my dream. Amen.